And yes, we're live, right? <laughs> okay, great. Welcome, Corey. How are you? I'm amazing. Thank you. Welcome to everybody watching and thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us today. And we have a lot of comments um, we, since we just started. Um, so welcome everyone. We can wait a bit for more and more people before we start our webinar today. Um, this is our very first webinar with one of our thought leaders. We're really, really excited. We want to do a lot more. We have uh, a lot to do for our community. So uh, thank you for joining, Corey. Uh, before I uh, leave the presentation to you, I want to still wait for more people and maybe give a quick uh, explaining of our community and our platform. So, yes. Thank you for joining, guys. <laughs> so, Global AI Hub is the leading community for artificial intelligence, con connecting hundreds of uh, thousands of experts and talents worldwide. Our uh, aim is to go global. Uh, we have world-class learning programs on AI, data, robotics, and other digital technologies. We offer guidance and mentoring like with people like you through you um, for personal career development in several uh, sectors. We also have hubs to expand the network, learn from others, and also connect with more people. And we also have recommended learning paths for practical project works and skill assessments to um, build the required skills and experience for the future job uh, opportunities. Um, so I want to listen to works that you do, Corey, and also I want to hear uh, how do you feel about this uh, webinar and our company? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I'm really first and foremost excited about this webinar because I've had many dozens of people reach out personally and mm -hmm. thank me for doing this, tell me that they've been really wanting to learn more about, you know, NFTs and LinkedIn kind of you know, told me not to talk too much about NFTs on the platform. So people have been waiting to hear me kind of be able to talk more about this. Yes, so I first know. of all, that's awesome. I was also a fan of Global AI Hub when you first reached out to me. I love what you guys are doing. One of the companies I've been involved with for a number of years is called Founder Institute. And we're a, we're a global company and, you know, we've helped launch thousands of startups. But one of the big ones that came out of our ecosystem was Udemy. And I like Udemy a lot. They're a bit, you know, they're a unicorn at this point. They've helped a mm -hmm. lot of people learn to code and some of the other platforms mm -hmm. as well. But sometimes you really think that like people that can afford these are the ones that are already probably making money or already have careers. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes, yeah, you have to invest some, some additional time to learn, but you want to see people that can't access stuff like that succeed. Mm -hmm. And when I learned that like, not only is, is the, hashtag 10 million AI project free. Um, and mm -hmm. then, you know, some of the some of the initiatives and mandates is to help everyone in the world understand technology better, learn it to the extent that they can get jobs. Like anybody watching this, my goal after an hour session is for people that love and resonate with this new internet that's coming out, this web three that's built on blockchains and smart contracts and protocols. Yeah. Like I want people to learn so much in less than an hour that they could potentially go get a job in this industry, right? And I think that we can change lives and change people's tr growth trajectories and professional lives by doing things like this. It's just so hugely passionate. And so coming to know Global AI Hub more, getting to know the leadership team, understanding some of the partnerships, seeing companies like uh, Amazon, Microsoft, mm -hmm. Tata Consultancy, like when they get behind something like this, it gives me so much hope, not only for the future of business, the future of big tech, um, the, fu the future of kind of global business, um, mm -hmm. you know, being conducted in a way that's really fair, equitable, all of that, this is the future. So 
super stoked on global AI hub, super stoked on Thanks. the, the uh, 10 million AI project. Love that this is uh, so accessible to so many people, right? It's so much of what you do is free of charge. So much of it is really intended to help, you know, the marginalized, the less represented, you know, people from around the world, women, all of that kind of have equal opportunities in tech. I'm all for all of this. So just super stoked to be here. Great. We are, feelings are mutual. And so since we have a lot of people here, uh, we can start this webinar. Um, before starting it, maybe uh, you can mention the topics, the hot topics around the globe, which we all very interested in those. So, um, yes. Absolutely. So I think we'll jump into the presentation in just a few in a few moments. But what I'd love to do is ask everyone in the crowd and feel free to use the chat feature if you like. Yes. I want to know how many people that are tuned in right now believe that they've been in the metaverse already. So mm -hmm. if you're watching this and you think you've been in the metaverse already, I definitely <laughs> want to know. And if you're watching this and you think yeah, you, you have you not... Always Ask that question. I wonder why. I also always wondered why that you ask that question. And when I think about it, I don't really think that we're living in the metaverse, but I'm wondering what do you think? Well, here's what I think. I think that it is Wednesday afternoon in Chicago and mm -hmm. that somehow I am in your office or your living room at some other time in some other part of the country. And I think that I am there digitally, but yeah. I'm here right now talking. You're hearing the words come out of my mouth as I open it. So to me, you know, kind of a spoiler alert as people are answering the question, <laughs> um, there are a lot of people that would say we're in the metaverse right now, right? You and I mm -hmm. are talking digitally. I'm in your living room, but I'm in a different country that begins to transcend some of the things that even some of the original you know things you could do online when the internet was emerging um couldn't be done before so you know that's kind of what one of the things i like people to just think about right off the bat is their arguments and their intellectuals that believe that we're in a metaverse already now mm -hmm. there are Makes other sense. people that say the metaverse is years and years away from from happening and there are people that think that we're going to need to put lenses in our, our you know eyes or glasses on or headsets to access the metaverse i think augmented reality mixed reality virtual reality um is going to enhance the metaverse you know i've got mm -hmm. my my headsets and stuff like that and i love to put them on and immerse myself yeah in, i know <laughs> <laughs> you know networking or meditation or whatever it might be i think that's a cool conduit to the metaverse but when people mm -hmm. ask me you know what i think the real um, window to the metaverse is going to be to me it's smart tvs um i think followed by things like tablets computers phones um and in, in a few weeks i'll be in las vegas as one of the keynotes at the metaverse expo we're going to be you know releasing and, and and reviewing some new tech and some stuff there as well i think right now there's not a a, a completely cohesive idea on what exactly the metaverse will look like but yes. the concepts that we'll get into is it will be decentralized, it will be interoperable, it will mm -hmm. have different levels of emerge, immersion that are um, available, right? Not necessarily uh, nece necessary, but available. Um, and so we'll get more into that in a minute. I can tell you, you got a question for me. Uh, yeah, I just, uh, I'm like looking at the comments and everybody is saying hi i'm from this country and that place so i'm really excited to have all of those people at once um that's that's our goal actually we, we want to have that big global ai community um with experts thought leaders like you mentoring people um your exp sharing your experiences and the question in my mind was that uh, you told me that Facebook sent you a, a VR, right? You're, I mean, you're experiencing th those uh, technologies right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's also really interesting. Well, I'm, I'm to be candid, I'm a little disappointed with some of the, the existing oh, really? tech as far as mm -hmm. metaverses go. 
but then I can tell you, I've also got a front seat to some of the new technology and some of the new companies and um, what the public can see right now, as far as like VR and metaverses is not where the industry is, you know, mm -hmm. and I can point to companies like TCG world. that has got a big metaverse right now. That's amazing. You know, people say it's like uh, grand theft auto, but without the, the violence and the, you know, and the missions, I can point to companies like Mozverse that literally has plug and play web three and metaverse capabilities that are just incredible. I look at uh, Epic and their unreal engine they're making quite literally photorealistic avatars. My team's put an avatar together of me that looks almost exactly like me and it moves like me. And, you know, the goal is to get it to even think and act like me so it can coach more people and, and do that for free. Cause right now I'm expensive as a coach and I want to help the people that can't afford, you know, to pay people mm -hmm. hundreds or thousands of dollars an hour, you know, really similar to what global AI hub is, is doing with, you know, with your mission and everything mm -hmm. that you've brought to the world. So, um, there's there's existing technology and i'm trying to submerge myself in all of it i want to learn all of it i want to learn what facebook is doing right and wrong i want to learn you know what apple's doing in their own silo and i want to learn why microsoft is buying right like uh, activision blizzard for for tens of billions of dollars and right so i have to learn more about roblox and fortnite and all of these different things that are that are bringing the technologies together and then mm -hmm. I think one of the things we'll get into more is that in Web3, there's no longer this disparity between software, right? It, there's no such thing as Apple or Android in Web3. There's no such thing as Microsoft or Google, right? You can use Microsoft, you can use Google, you can use Apple, you can use Android. But if it, mm -hmm. if it stops there, right, if it's boxed in, if you can't take that to any other experience, then it's not Web3. Um, really, that to me was one of the key components of web of the new Web three that I got so interested in is this concept of interoperability that we'll get into a little bit more. Okay. Um, so someone told that there's a big chance that we are living in a metaverse. Like you have those supporters. <laughs> well, and that what they're probably talking about is actually the simulated reality theory, which is. Um, you, you have people like Elon Musk and Neil deGrasse Tyson that both say the chances that we're living in base reality is zero. They're both convinced scientifically, mathematically. Um, yeah, Ali, I'm right there with mm -hmm. you. And But but I think here here's the thing, right? Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, Elon Musk swear we're living in the metaverse already. They think that we have been for probably thousands of years. Right. They, they don't believe that we needed the technology to be living in a simulation um, and they believe that they can actually prove that. But I think, you know, the majority of people, when they hear that, they run the other way or they go, no, we're not living in a simulation. And I, I, I need people that don't believe that to understand that's fine. Right. They don't need to think we're living in a simulation to believe that the metaverse is coming. The metaverse is coming for absolutely everybody, regardless of whether or not you think, you know, that you're the center of the universe, you're the only person, that you're just an animal and you're no different than an ant. And right, like no matter what people believe, they'll be able to to get into this, what I kind of consider to be the fourth dimension or, uh, you know, our foray mm -hmm. into the fourth dimension. So, yeah, I think for the people that are kind of like, you know, really supporters of those theories, like the simulation reality, great. But those that, that hear that and, and, you know, they might as well be talking about Bigfoot, don't worry, mm -hmm. this is still for you too. Will we also talk about the accessibility of metaverse? I mean, I'm wondering that part too, because it's a really big question mark for a lot of people for now. Maybe in five years, things will be a lot more different. But I know that some people think like, how can I access to that? I don't know etc cetera, etc cetera. so what do you think about that i think that if if something cannot be accessed by any mobile phone any television any computer period if if wi-fi doesn't get you into the metaverse then that's not the metaverse so i mm -hmm. think you know a lot of people are really caught up on you know oh i'm never going to get a chip put in me great you don't need a chip put in you I'm never going to mm -hmm. put a huge headset on. Great. You don't have to do that either, right? These all are potential portals into the metaverse. But if you can't get there with your phone, 
or with your TV or, you know, whatever it might be. And I think we're mm-hmm. going to see a huge pop in like Apple Glass, Google Glass. I think the glasses are going to become much more relevant. You can, yeah. especially like the blue blocker styles, you can turn into fully immersive screens or you can look through them and, you know, get more of the augmented or the mixed reality experience. Mm-hmm. But I think, you know, again, just to really hammer home, if you can't access it through your handheld device or your television, then to me, that's not an interoperable or democratized metaverse. So, yes. you know, it's cool that I can put on the, the, the Facebook's version of Oculus and, and see other people walk around and talk to them and go to a stand-up mm-hmm. comedy club and, you know, their little world. But it blows my mind. They spent tens of billions of dollars on their metaverse and it's global and they've got millions upon millions of potential users. But there's like 10 to 15 people in their metaverses at any given time worldwide. It's, it's incredible how little adoption they have. And it's because it's not interoperable. It's right. It's very limited, which is kind of the antithesis of Web3. Mm -hmm. So I think we can start your presentation. Perfect. Yeah. So we'll start off very briefly with kind of what is Web3 is the focus of this (laughs) and why should we care? Biggest deal. Right. And I think what's Web3? we'll get into a little bit more about what web one was and what web two is, but web three is the new internet that makes things possible on the blockchain, like the metaverse. So if everyone can just kind of understand that whatever you think about web three, whatever your knowledge of it is that we will unpack that a little bit more. I just really want to tune us all into the fact that web three is what empowers these new you know, internet experiences. And the reason that we should care is every business is needing to adopt this. Everybody working in these fields right now is making substantially more money than their counterparts that are not working in Web3. The programming languages are becoming so much more universal. There's a lot of low code, no code options. There's a lot of, you know, plug and play options like Mozverse, where you don't need a huge dev team to build a Web3 product or a Metaverse or a Metaverse adjacent product. So it becomes a lot easier. The barriers of entry are a lot lower. There's also mm-hmm. a big focus on data privacy. One of my company's information is really focused on data privacy on the blockchain as well and giving the, the data, the access, the monetization of data to the people who the data belongs to. Who's that? It's you, right? It's me. <laughs> it's insane up it right yeah. so that's a big focus on web3 and that's why we should care there's a lot of money to be made there's a lot of um you know the stuff that we've all always postulated was wrong with going online or trying to network online or find a job online this is all being solved with and by web3 so that's why we should care and i will just point our eyes you'll see at the bottom of every slide in my presentation um that I am not a financial advisor. Nothing in this presentation today is intended as financial advice. I will not ask anybody today or ever for their uh, digital wallets. Make sure you research Mm -hmm. anything you get involved in on your own. So that's a little disclaimer. And then if we can advance to the next slide, I'll just talk about myself for a quick second. If people care more you know, want to learn more about me and what I do and who I am. Yes, I need you to follow me on we social. do. <laughs> well, <laughs> look, that's that's another story for another day. But you know, very quickly, okay. my name is Corey Warfield. You see me there with my little Facebook headset on. <laughs> and, um, one, one of my one of my team and great great talent uh, drew that picture of me the other day. So I, you know, I, I thought a digital mm-hmm. representation of me is a good way to kind of you know step into this discussion around Web three and metaverse, but. I've started a number of technology companies as a founder, as a CEO. Um, you know, that was about seven years ago that I started my first company. So I'm still somewhat new um, in, into this whole world. But, um, you know, I've, I've been fortunate. I've been able to raise some millions of dollars for my own and others projects. Uh, I was the managing director at Founder Institute um, along, alongside a co-director for some time. I'm now the entrepreneur in residence there at Founder Institute Midwest. Um, so I've been able to help a lot of other startups and right, make a lot of introductions. LinkedIn's been very kind to me. So LinkedIn's where I've got probably my most concentration of activity, engagement, fans, and opportunities. Um, but I'm taking, you know, anything from TikTok, Twitter, Facebook, Insta more seriously as well. Uh, I'm building a community on a platform called Scale Growth, 
very active yes. on, you know, Discord and a number of other platforms as well. So um, in, in a nutshell, I love technology. I love startups. I love seeing people succeed. I love social media. And that's all kind of culminated um, to where I'm now, you know, known as, and I, I think, you know, the numbers would, would back this up, one of the leading metaverse influencers, certainly on LinkedIn, if not the world. And, you know, next month I'll be at uh, the Metaverse Expo in Vegas. I just came back from Miami and I'm kind of really deep into this world now. And it's because I believe in it so deeply and I see so many of the opportunities. So um, if we can move to the next slide, please. Um, this is where we'll get kind of more into the presentation itself. So before we can talk about what Web3 is, we need to really uh, Sorry, Cody, yeah. I, I, I was going to say something. Before moving on, uh, I want to tell that we will have a Q&A session at the end of our presentation. So I'm not uh, disregarding your questions, everyone. <laughs> I'm saving them. So yeah, we can move on. Perfect. Thank you so much for that. Um, mm -hmm. And you can interrupt me anytime. So feel feel free. When okay. you talk, I listen. But uh, okay, so to hop back into, we can't talk about Web3 if we don't kind of have some shared common language around what, what Web1 was, what Web2 is. Now, when Web1 was here, it wasn't called Web1, Web right? I think you had kind of two schools of thought, people that thought the internet was, was finally here and the internet was the internet and that was it. And it, you know, it would never change. And you had people that thought the internet was a fad. But you know, back then it was either known as the World Wide Web or just the internet. And the way that we accessed it was through dial-up modems that plugged into our walls, yes. just like our phones did. And, you know, there wasn't a lot of community there. There were, there were forums, right? There were, there were chat rooms. Um, and, and I'm, you know, I'm 44 years old. So I remember I used to participate in all of those. And I used to use GeoCities and Angel Fire and, and build, <laughs> you know, chat, chat rooms and things of that nature. But there was nothing coming in or out of a chat room. It was its own. It, it was almost as though you were in the only room in a house. Like that was a studio apartment. And if you chose to mm -hmm. be there, there was nothing else going on, right? You couldn't, you couldn't walk out and come back in. A lot of companies had their websites and you saw the dot-com bubble, but a website was just a website. You went to that website and that's where you did whatever you were going to do. Right. You started to see a couple early entrants, you know, not only into like search with Yahoo and Google, but some of the people starting to aggregate data from around the Internet um, onto their websites. But it was still very siloed, very static. There was really not not much. Uh, it wasn't very media rich. And mm -hmm. so that's what we started to see with Web2. And I think, you know, depending on the age of, of the people that are watching this, um, they may have just been born into Web2 and not even know that the internet used to be this really kind of patchworked experience where everything was in the silo. But with Web2, Web you kind of started to see things like social media and true aggregator sites like an Amazon. Um, oh, thank you so much, Kaz. You're amazing as well. Um, mm -hmm. But this is where you started to see things like social media, right? Uh, videos, things like YouTube. This is where you started to see some of the disparate, uh, you know, technologies start to form into like the Googles of today, right? And now they mm -hmm. own YouTube and, and, you know, they tried to do their own social community for a while called Google Plus. But the Web2 really sought to bring the experience more to wherever people were, right? And you started to not only see things like social media, but you started to see things like uh, a good example is Google, where they were able to provide anything you needed in your experience without you ever having to leave. So if you want to see pictures, cool, they'll show you pictures. They're Google pictures, right? And if you needed some results for whatever you're looking for, they'll give you Google answers and links to Google sites. And right, so they really tried hard, even in the early days, to bring kind of what people needed to them so that people didn't need to leave. If I've got you on my website, but then you leave, you're no longer on my website. If I can bring whatever you needed into my website, then I don't lose your eyeballs. I don't lose my business model, especially if it's right selling ads, harvesting data, anything like that. So that's mm -hmm. been kind of the journey of the internet so far. That's how we went from kind of having a, you know, and I'm, I can probably still, although I won't do it right now, sing the old dial up, you know, song. It used to sit there and literally wait for your modem to connect to the internet for, for many seconds, <laughs> if not a minute or two. Um, you couldn't get internet on your phone back then, right? That was another thing that was introduced kind of with the web too. 
And so when we think about Web 2.0, again, it wasn't called Web 2.0. It was just called the Internet doesn't suck anymore back then. But that was the iteration, right? That was the new um, kind of revelation. And we saw a whole, mu- whole bunch more um, come out as far as like e-commerce and, you know, freelancing and, and marketplaces like Odesk, Upwork, that kind of thing, side hustles. Yes, an influencer as a new area of like a, a new sector for people. <laughs> yeah, and, and not only that, but a multi-billion dollar sector and the sector yes, that yes. quite literally creating self-made billionaires. Absolutely right. And, and now everyone one... understands the importance of a commun- community and that's why we need more <laughs> like Web3. Oh, I couldn't agree more. Absolutely. So, right, the original World Wide Web was disrupted by aggregators and communities. That was kind of the, the hallmark for um, and, and, and the genesis for the reason of needing a new Internet. But one of the mm-hmm. big concerns and one of the big obstacles that came out of this was data privacy. All of a sudden, if you can bring anything into your experience that you need, who who knows that? Right? How do they know that? Who made money? And mm-hmm. it's very interesting if, if everyone on the call were to think about how much money have you made in your life off of the data that's been generated online. Most of you probably haven't made any money, right? Like literally zero dollars and zero cents. But all of you individually have made probably tens of, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars for individual companies, right? Like literally yes. you <laughs> have probably made Google hundreds of thousands of dollars just by yourself. And you got zero dollars of it, right? Facebook as well and some of their subsidiaries. And so this becomes a big problem. And they don't mm-hmm. just make all of the money that your data made and give you none of it. They don't get your permission for it. They use it in ways that you don't want them to use. And they're just getting started. They have thousands of data points on all of us. And they can make money off any of those many times over. It's not even binary. So there has been a need for some time for a new, better uh, Internet. And so yes. if we can advance to the next slide, please. We are now in this age where, and it's still very nascent, but we're, we're, we're starting to see a lot more come out in this new internet or the web three. So um, I, I can kind of, it's a little small on my slide, but it says over that web three logo, which is cool. It's kind of like the, you know, the, the W on its side is a three, but no more dependence on big tech. Not yeah. to say you won't <laughs> still have a reliance and that Google and some of these companies won't still have a stronghold, but this is what the web three is really moving towards is decentralized. We see mm-hmm. things like DAOs, decentralized organization, things like decentralized finance, DeFi, which is all crypto, you know, basically um, what, what the, the, the foundation of all NFTs, um, it's all decentralized. And that's a really good thing. And that plays into the kind of no more dependence on big tech interoperability. Mm-hmm. Again, huge. If I, can't, if I can't have you work on my Google Doc and you're a Microsoft user, we've probably all lived through that pain point before. That's not cool, it's not productive, and it's not Web3, right? If I build a really cool avatar and I buy some really cool clothes for my avatar and a, and a cool man purse, right? I've, got, I've gotten into man purses lately, um, and, <laughs> cool. and I've got all this digital currency in my avatar's pocket and I'm walking around a metaverse. If when I want to go to another metaverse, I can't wear my same fly clothes and have my same fat stack of cash, and if I can't still have the same skills that's not Web3. It's not interoperable. So right now mm-hmm. I could build up the most amazing profound avatar in the Facebook metaverse. However, if it stays within that metaverse, then it's not interoperable. So it's not Web3. Smart contracts and protocols is really kind of the foundation of everything on the blockchain. Um, you know, how that, how that chain of custody and, and that ownership and everything is recorded. And then when you hear about mining and you hear about different activities on the blockchain, this is literally people validating in a decentralized way, again, um, you know, that these are indeed what they say they are and having kind of, you know, disparate authorities that don't know each other, that don't have any reference points, you know, saying and showing how these are all real, whether it's a proof of work, which was how it used to be, or the proof of stake, which is what blockchains are moving toward, which are much better for the environment. But that's the way that they're able to make sure that everything is what it's supposed to be. And that's why it's so secure. It's why it's so efficient. 
It's why economists are buying up millions of dollars of, you know, metaverse property and buying into real estate uh, and NFT projects and such. Data privacy, as I said, if all of our data is on a blockchain, it can be private. Mm -hmm. We can see where it all goes, how it's used. We can authorize whether or not money's made from it. Um, this is not a pitch, but I encourage everyone, if they're interested, to look at my company, Information. It's INF, the number four, and then Mation.com, mm -hmm. just to check out our white paper and see what we're doing. And, you know, that I'm sure there are other people doing it, although we haven't found anybody, you know, that we consider to have competitive tech. But we're putting data privacy on the blockchain and letting you sell it if you want to and make the money or not, right? If you don't ever want it sold and you don't want the money, no one else gets the money. That's one of the things that, that is not only what we're doing, but is is really kind of a hot button topic in the in the metaverse space, in the Web3 space. Um, we'll get into NFTs in a bit, but we do have our own NFT marketplace. We're also signing people up on our whitelist. So um, that could be something if you go to the website and you're interested that you could pursue. But to get back into the definition of Web3, right, you've got mm -hmm. the crypto, you've got the decentralized finance, you've got the NFTs. Those all really play into each other. Those are all available in Web3. They're not all necessary. And when people hear about crypto, you hear about stable coins and meme coins and all these things. The reality is it's just a digital representation of whatever currency you have. Because mm -hmm. even if it's a Dogecoin or a Zill or, a, or an HBAR, or, it's all was bought with whatever your local currency is. And it's what you can cash it out for and that you can redeem. So it's, it's not that it's a different currency. Is this a different way to store access and spend currency? And people that have been into Forex for some time, it's, well, if I buy a bunch of, you know, Brazilian HEIs or Turkish currency or, you know, rupees yeah. or whatever, and then they go up in value, my money's worth more. Same thing with crypto, right? If, if, mm -hmm. if it becomes worth more money, then your money is worth more money. And if it goes down, yeah. like... You described project. it perfectly. I mean, the simple way to understand that, yeah. Um, I also have a question before moving on because um, I want to learn more about the smart contracts. I mean, what does it mean? I know yeah. the main concept of the smart contract between uh, like the NFT and the uh, purchased uh, products, etc. But I don't know if everybody knows it or so. Well, I think there's there's it's probably a little bit deeper of a dive than we have time to go on to today. Um, we can always mm -hmm. do a follow up, but very simply, if you think about a transaction in the real world, there's going to be some contract for it, whether it's a receipt, whether it's a right, whatever it is. And and the smart contracts can be written in any number of ways and based on any number of protocols. But basically, they're what's referenced on the blockchain. So they're their own block on the blockchain. They're referenced for any transaction to go through, um, but really they're kind of the digital check and balance and is not manipulatable by people. Okay, thank you. Was that helpful at all? Yeah. <laughs> Perfect, awesome. And yeah, there's a lot more There's a lot more to it than that, but really, I mean, it's they are just contracts and the smart part of the smart contract is that they're on the blockchain. Um, also with the Web3 metaverse connectivity, as we've said, and the potential for the immersive experiences also. Um, mm -hmm. So that to me is really what the Web3 is. The big difference is it's decentralized, it's interoperable, and it's on the blockchain as well. Um, so if we can move to the next slide. How are we doing on time? How much should we leave for the Q&A? 15 minutes or so? Yeah, it's... We can do it as we wish, I think, because Perfect. we have a lot of questions. <laughs> That's what I figured. So, okay, I don't want to talk too fast, um, but but yeah. I'll, I'll be cognizant that, we, that we've that we got a number of questions coming up. So mm -hmm. this is just a very simplified um, slide of some of the use cases for Web3. And I'll just kind of read the, these out loud and, and give my own two cents. I, I wrote this just the other day. But really, the mm -hmm. use cases for Web3, it's all about blockchain, but it's also the ownership of digital assets. So as I mentioned, if you have some digital clothes for your avatar, that could be an NFT. And a, a company that I'm involved in that I'm really bullish on is called Mason Dow, M-A-I-S-O-N-D-A-O. Again, Dow is a decentralized autonomous organization, but we're mm -hmm. doing fashion in the metaverse. So you can buy really cool NFTs. You can buy real world clothes that come with NFTs. So you can dress your avatar just like you got some really fun shoes. 
Um, I'm working with some other companies in the fashion metaverse as well. And, and I'm working with the fashion, with the metaverse fashion council. Um, but that's one thing you can think of for an NFT, digital clothes for your avatar. But also you can think about like your education, uh, your school records, your transcripts, your diplomas, your degrees. You can think about the title to your uh, house or car, right? Your deed. These can be NFTs. Um, think about yeah. an original piece of digital art or music. But there are also people that are NFTing their social media posts, right? So it's really any digital representation of anything, whether it's digital or physical, the digital representation and the ownership there. And so there's a smart contract on a blockchain that shows that it's yours, right? It's really... Go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's really broad. Like, it, it, it gives me goosebumps. <laughs> I mean, it's... I'm, I'm seeing this all positive, like uh, it's a great advancement, but at the si same time, it's so broad that we can um, convert everything well, to... And that, that's what mm -hmm. confuses people, but you're absolutely yeah. right. It really is that broad. I'm working with a company right now, a pro sports team, and we're putting all of her pro athletes or basketball players, we're putting their contracts as NFTs. People can buy into their contract. Now they quite literally own part of somebody's contract, a professional athlete's contract and their endorsements and their likeness and right, everything. And it's all mm -hmm. on smart contracts as well. So there really is, I mean, it, as I read down here um, in this list that I came up with, it's not only like fractional ownership of real world assets like stocks, but it's also, mm -hmm. you can even think about like your plane ticket or your concert ticket, right? Anything that's on your phone, and right now they have some some good protocols and ways to make sure 10 people don't use the same digital ticket, right? But those as NFTs, that's your ticket until it's scanned and then it goes away and the NFT is burned, right? Like yeah. it, it Problem solved. Some, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Much more seamless experience. And then outside of kind of just the, the ownership of digital assets is anything blockchain, right? So interoperability between chains, smart contracts, as we've talked about, data privacy, asset management, um, but also things like digital marketing attribution, right? The, the different esports and blockchain games. All of this is, is things you can use Web3 for. Uh, E-commerce is a big one. Um, you know, the creator economy as well has already been rocked by Web3. So these are just some things to think about when you're thinking about like what Web3 can be used for. And what I didn't want to do is simplify it this much, but I did want to mention, really, you can think of anything you could use the internet for that's your use case for web3 right these are kind of how does web3 enhance some of those experiences but there's nothing you can think of that you would want to do online whether it's apply for a job pay a speeding ticket shop for new new blankets anything that you would do on the internet you can do it on web3 um so if yeah. we could please move to the next slide Perfect. Yes. This probably took this probably took long because I wanted this animation. I just love it. Uh -huh. When I think about the you know the metaverse specifically and, and Web three being what supports that, in my opinion, it is the fourth dimension. To me, the metaverse mm -hmm. transcends time and space. We're working on projects where I can go back and have a conversation with George Washington, right? I can relive even in a submersive experience things that happened in the past. Or we can use quantum computing and project and, and, and predict things in the future. And I can go experience what the future might be like. This transcends all of that. So, you know, I, I put very simply transcends space and time beyond the third dimension. Um, the fourth dimension also is considered to be the realm of extended consciousness, right? Whether it's spiritual, ethereal. Um, Einstein said it's the bending of space time. So when we mm -hmm. think about kind of all of those concepts, and I'm going to pull up, I had a quote as well um, that I wanted to share about the fourth dimension. A guy named Neil mm -hmm. Cassidy said, we are actually fourth dimensional beings in a third dimensional body inhabiting a second, a second dimensional world, right? Oh. To me, the metaverse can open us up more to our potential. Mm -hmm. If we think about our brains as a CPU or a computer, right? We're only using this little limited bit of it. But when you think about our reality and what we're living in, you know, so much opens up if space and time become less of a constraint. That's what I believe we're beginning to see being built in Web3. Are we there yet? Not at all. Um, but really, that was one of the concepts that opened up my eyes to what the 
you know, what the metaverse could could really usher in. And I really mm -hmm. am, I'm kind of stuck on that concept that it's the fourth dimension. And I think that's revolutionary. It, it's definitely something that has sparked some great debates. Um, but I think it's definitely a thought concept that can help kind of just as we really try to internalize and process what the metaverse could be. Um, yeah. So if we can, you yeah. You also told that, ask that, are we living in the fourth dimension? Why did you ask that question? Before? Uh, <laughs> I really just want people to start to lean in and think about it on their own. And if they're wondering uh -huh. that in their heads, if they're pondering that, whatever they land on, at least they're now really thinking about the metaverse in the way that mm -hmm. I think a lot of us that are you know, starting companies and growing companies in that space are thinking about it too. So it's really just bringing people onto that you know, that common language and, and that, that, that thought journey that we can always expand upon. Um, but yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it, it was a concept that blew my mind. And just like all my other best tweets, it got zero likes. I, I, I love Twitter, but I can't get any traction. But when I tweeted that and reread my own tweet, I'm the only person that saw it, I got goosebumps. And so, <laughs> you know, when I can, when I can put something so simply that that it makes me think differently about things. And I know that that's something I at least want to share and see how it resonates with others. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. So, yep, we're going to move into what are NFTs. Okay. We kind of talked about it a bit. Um, but they can be either one of one or one of many pieces of digital art. Um, and right, they can have so many different things behind them. They can be a song. Um, they, I think Wu-Tang Clan was famous. They did a one of one album where only one person in the world could buy their album and mm -hmm. I think it was a cd because i think it was a long time ago um maybe it was an mp3 but that would have been a good example of a one of one or a house when you buy a house it's the only one of that house in the world even if all your neighbors look the same um so that's one of one most of the nfts that i own are one of ones right now so i bought it it's got a serial number it's on a blockchain it's either puts me as part of a club or part of an owner or um, it's got some other utility behind it, but a lot mm -hmm. of what we hear about with NFTs are one of ones. And I can give an example of a guy, I can't say his real name, but he goes by Burnt Banksy out of Florida. He bought a piece of art by a, by a street artist named Banksy, a graffiti artist that was amazing. Mm -hmm. And he owned the art. That was a one of one. It was done. It was the only, only copy of this art in the world. And he videotaped himself burning it to the ground. And so that digital copy was the only known known digital representation of the art. And then you got to see it burn. And he sold that video as a one of one mm -hmm. NFT. And I think he sold it for a million dollars, right? So people really like that was the only way you could see this art. And then you were the one that they got to show it being burnt and you can license that out or, you know, help hype it up and sell it for more money. But there's also this concept of one of many. So many people can buy into it. So there's one great NFT, maybe it's got a lot of utility behind it, but they let 10,000 people on the same NFT, they all get the same benefit. So that's just one thing to think about is not all NFTs are created equal. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I put in this little circle over the eight that should be moving for us, but it says uh, NFTs <laughs> become a multi-billion dollar industry, which is true. Yes. You know, even one known uh, project called, called the Board Ape Yacht Club by Yuga Labs, they've done one point four billion dollars in revenue already and they've only been around for 18 months so they've done over a billion in revenue that helped them raise a half billion dollar investment round at a multi-billion dollar valuation so now they've mm -hmm. got you know over a billion dollars cash on hand now they just put on a conference that didn't go well and there's a lot in the news about them and i was one of those people you know when we talk about nfts and crypto are risky i bought a bunch of their ape coin when it came out because i was really bullish on their ecosystem and um that's one of the ones mm -hmm. i don't want to i don't want to look at right now i don't want to see what it's down to it's you know if, in my mind it's worth zero at this point and it is what it is you don't put anything into crypto you can't lose but i was really excited about that one um but so it's a multi-billion dollar industry and nfts could be anything right membership to a club um a lot of the utility behind them is redeemable for something whether it's a offer an online uh, offering you know, as I mentioned before, like a fractional sports contract, anything like that. So people say, what does NFTs stand for? And, and people literally will, will go, oh, it stands for a non-fungible token. That doesn't mean mm -hmm. anything. If you never heard the word fungible before, you heard of an NFT, neither did anybody, right? Like, um, 
but that's effectively fungible something that you know is tangible that you can hold and you know nfts are something that are you know a little bit more ethereal they're, they're digital so um you know, don't get too caught up on the acronym but really it's just a digital property that you can prove ownership of on a blockchain um yes. so i'm starting to get towards the end of, of my presentation and i think you know the, the q a will probably be some of the most um beneficial so i'll just move very quickly um through the next slide is how to buy nfts i think most people get caught up on this one so this is probably worth spending a few minutes on and then i just show a couple of my nfts that i think are, are cute and fun and say thanks on the last slide so i'll spend the last few minutes of my presentation on this and we'll move into q a um, and ask me anything but the way to buy an nft find out what chain it's on Right. If it's on Ethereum, it'll probably be on OpenSea and you'll probably need to use Bitcoin or Ethereum to buy it. If it's on Cardano, then you'll you know, you'll probably get it on CNFT and you'll probably need to have whatever their wallet's called. Um, it'll come to me. But and then you need to buy ADA, which is a Cardano token to buy those. Um, you know, if it's on WAX, which is the worldwide asset exchange, you need their token. Um, Polygon. So this might all sound confusing, but to distill it, to make it easy, whatever mm -hmm. platform the NFT is on, you're going to need to work within their ecosystem. So you're going to need their crypto and you're going to need their wallet. You know, a lot of stuff ties to like a MetaMask or, you know, some of the different um, exchanges wallets right now, but ultimately you're going to want Cardano's is called NAMI, N-A-M-I. But so you need a special wallet, you need a special crypto, you need to know how much crypto to have. So if something's going to launch at 0 0.2 Ethereum and that's 300 bucks, you got to spend 300 bucks on 0 0.2 Ethereum, have a little bit more to cover gas fees, or if it is Ethereum, have a lot more to cover gas fees. I've heard of times where the gas fee is actually equivalent to the purchase price. That's why we're really bullish on Polygon, Cardano, anything else, right? Binance, anything that's not Ethereum. Um, at least yet. But so that's the big one is just find out what token, you know, what blockchain it's going to be on and what token you need to buy it. If you can get on a whitelist, if you know of a project that you're really bullish on, try to get on their whitelist because then if it sells out, you're one of the ones that get them. I know people that have spent, you know, the equivalent of $30 on an NFT they got from a whitelist that they literally turned around within 12 hours of getting and sold for thousands of dollars, right? If it's the right project, um, you know, and there's an element of luck as well, but getting it on the mint, meaning when it was made, its first kind of presence on the blockchain, that's where you can make the most money. Um, but so that's as easy as it is. Find out what token and what blockchain and what wallet. That wallet is where you'll store it, where you can move it into a cold storage wallet. So basically like a real wallet, but that, mm -hmm. you know, if the wallet's not open, which you're the only one that can do, then no one has access to the digital files inside of it. It's really well encrypted. Um, but and then the other thing is immerse yourself in their community. Every successful NFT project is going to have an engaged Twitter community yeah. and Discord. Again, again, community power strikes. Absolutely. And it's not, if you go to a project and they have 10,000 people on Twitter and they have 10,000 people in Discord, that seems great. But look at the activity. If they mm -hmm. have 10,000 people on their Discord and nobody's getting hyped up in the general channel, if there's not people chatting and going, hey, this artist just said this and this admin is doing that, and then it's not a good project. They can buy 10,000 people to sign up for a Discord that aren't going to buy into it, and it's going to go down to the, the, you know, the floor or below very quickly. So really researching. If, if the founders are doxxed, see what they've done before. See who they are. Anything that, that brings people accountable. Um, you know, let's see what else I have in there. Gauge the hype, right? Just, you know, if there's a if there's a good project that has utility and you like the art, um, then it's a matter of just knowing what currency you need, what wallet to have and um, get them where you fit in. So hopefully that was helpful. Um, I think we can move through just the next two slides quickly. Um, the, the, these are just a few of my NFTs on the next slide. Those, those, this, those on this one were, were mine as well. Mm -hmm. We've got my boss down, I've got, the, the rainbow guy with his little his little calf is Charles Hodgkinson. He was one of the two founders of uh, of Ethereum, and then he started Cardano in their company. I've got my Ada Yeti and you know my my loyal lion and my Psycho Kitty and this little ape. It's not a real ape. It's a it's a derivative of their mutants. But those are all kind of fun, and they all have different utility. The cat in the top left I, that's a, a DAO card, so that makes me a part owner in that company. The the um, that's the 
Sparse Cat Rocket it, Club. It looks, it looks like it's from a movie scene. Like it's, it sounds so similar to me, but I don't know which one. <laughs> no, and you're right, and I can't come up with it either, right? Like, but, but I think you're absolutely right. But anyway, we don't need to spend too much time on that. The last slide will just mm -hmm. thank you all for your time, um, and hopefully that was helpful. Hopefully, some people that were a little bit less proficient with, with what those mean. Um, you know, NFTs, Web3, hopefully that was helpful. And I'd love to open it up for any questions from the audience. Yeah, I, thank you again. It was it was great. And uh, Amanda told that I feel like this is NFTs for dummies because I knew very little about what this was. And I'm now learning from this webinar. I feel the same. I know that a lot of people is feeling the same. So thanks again for this opportunity. Dear Corey, <laughs> so I can now, we can look at the questions. Um, so yeah, let's pick one. Um, can you identify the components of the modern metaverse environments? <laughs> um, I'm not sure I fully understand that, but I think yeah, know, me the, neither. The, the the real things are, you know, the blockchain itself and the smart contracts and protocols. Um, but really, so one metaverse I really love right now is called Seek.com, C-E-E-K. They're doing like concerts. They just had Ziggy Marley in their metaverse of maybe a month or two ago, and millions of people got to see Ziggy Marley perform. So you've got basically the actual land, right? The map. I um, mean, take a company like TCG World that I'm hugely bullish on. They have a huge amount of metaverse real estate and you can buy the property and you can build maybe a casino on there and people can come gamble on your metaverse property and all the money that flows through there, the house makes some and right, the players can play to earn and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. But a metaverse should be interoperable. So you can almost think of the old uh, comic analogy of like multiverses right um but for me it's it is an environment that lives on a blockchain other than that i don't know necessarily what you mean by the components but you know, it's, it's whatever mean, they build yeah it's it's the one it's the elements you showed us uh, in your presentation like the central lights smart contracts uh nfts etc those are the components in my opinion yeah so, nfts are a big one thanks for that mm-hmm yeah, a long one. How can we decide or can we which metaverse will be permanent? Uh, do you think investing existing metaverses are logical right now? Because now dominant ones are uh, mana and sand, but in future they will be plenty of them. Yeah. Yeah. So I've, you know, I've played around in sandbox and other world and Decentraland and, um, you know, what I'm finding with a lot of them is they started building a little early and so they're not decentralized. And um, for me, any metaverse that's not decentralized is kind of a web to, um, you know, want, <laughs> uh metaverse. I'd be very apprehensive of anything that's building this silo right now. Um, you know, there's even a company that Magic Johnson just invested in called Simwin, and they're building everything mm. very much in a silo, very much Web 2. Um, you know, so I'm advising one of my the companies that I'm involved with to not to not get involved with them um, because I don't think that they're Web 3. I'd say anything that's not Web 3, I'd be very apprehensive of. Anything mm -hmm. where the graphics are, you know, unless you love the pixelated graphics or something like that, if there's a metaverse no. <laughs> right now where the graphics aren't good, I'd run mm -hmm. the other way. Um, I think I look at, some, you know, again, I'll, I'll, I'll keep pointing to TCG World and to Mozverse because they're both doing it the right way. Or Edge City by Mason Dow. You look at their graphics, they're incredible. Also, mm -hmm. I look at community projects that don't have a lot of community behind them right now. I'd be very apprehensive of, you know, I look at... Um, what was the Claymates pitch, pitch land by Claymates Snoop was involved. Um, when celebrities involve themselves, you're going to find a lot of scams and rug pulls. But I also think there's mm. going to be a lot of staying power. People want to be where Snoop is, where Shaq is, where, you know, any of their of kind course. Of favorite people. So I, I'd say anywhere that's got community, good graphics and is building in a Web3 fashion um, is probably a safe, you know, bet. 
again, nothing that I'm saying is financial advice. Um, but, but other than that, I mean, it's, this is still very nascent. My, my belief is that most metaverses will end up, you know, having to morph and adapt a little bit and play nicely with each other. But if, you know, I, I can tell you from personal experience and again, not financial advice where I'm putting my money right now is into TCG world. Um, I think that there's, you know, they, they've just, I don't know if I'm allowed to announce all the partnerships, but they've been, they've partnered with a couple of the huge billions of dollar titans of industry that are actively building really cool stuff there. Um, so, you know, do your own research. You didn't hear it here, but um, TCG World could be a great one to look at. Um, okay. You know, also just getting involved in projects that you believe in, like information. If people look at what we're doing at information and, and love it, I mean, you can always sign up for the white paper, the white list, or look at our white paper. But um, really, just getting involved in projects that you believe in, because any Web three project will end up working with metaverses soon. And kind of mm -hmm. following the projects and the founders that you believe in is probably the or, or the celebrities, but is probably better than trying to choose a metaverse and then seeing what happens. If that makes sense. Yes. So another one. How is AI involved in Web3? Well, I will tell you, <laughs> since we're down to four minutes, that's an amazing question. But the way that we'll find that out is by making sure that we're following Global AI Hub. Um, you know, coming to more of these types of, of uh, experiences. But I can say that we're using machine learning, deep machine learning and AI at my company, Corey Connects, to help people's avatars become smarter and more productive. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, when people say technology is going to come steal our jobs, I say that's a good thing. Like, let the technology do my job and make me money so I can go enjoy my life. But the yeah. only way that that'll work is with AI, you know, some true, truly deep machine learning algorithms. Um, I don't know the, the short answer to how AI is involved with Web3 other than to say intrinsically, but I can say, you know, someone that's now been studying quantum computing and a lot of the different emerging bleeding edge technologies, AI, in my assessment, is going to be involved with everything technological moving forward. You know, everything from the way that cars drive and park themselves to the way that clothes are dried to the way that our food is stored in our refrigerator. I'm really bullish on Internet of Things, industrial Internet of Things. Um, mm -hmm. I think that the entire world is going to be, you know, both digital and physical and need to interact with with each other in ways that humans don't need to, uh, you know, monitor 100% of the time. The only way that that works is with AI. So, um, you know, that's an amazing question and I'm glad you asked it, but I think the short answer is just intrinsically. Yes. So if you're available, I think we can have another 15 minutes for the questions. Well, you know that I love not only the company, but you. So if you tell me yeah. when you're for <laughs> more minutes, let me just check my calendar. Okay. Sure I don't have anybody that's going to that's gonna cancel a million dollar deal with me. No, it looks like I'm good. So yeah, let's let's keep going. Yeah, this so fun. I know that your day just started. It's noon uh, in the US. So <laughs> um, what's the blockchain future? Well, okay. If you ask me what the future of blockchain is, uh, I'm somewhat biased. Um, uh -huh. I'm suddenly more bullish on Binance, their, their, their Binance smart chain than I ever have been, not only because information's built on them, TCG world's built on them, right? All of a sudden, some of the projects that I see getting the most market share, the most traction, the most VC funding, everything seem to either be on Binance or Polygon. So to me, it's like, Binance and Polygon um, probably are going to continue to gain market share and dominance. Um, I'm really bullish on Cardano. I, I have been and I still am. I, I have reason to, to be so, but um, I know enough people that are smarter than me that aren't. And, you know, I see more and more of the people that um, that I've learned from that I would that I would probably take anything that they thought and said very seriously are starting to move away from Cardano and the other one that I really liked was HBAR. Um, some of the people I knew that were really bullish on HBAR, which is kind of a blockchain alternative, um, are starting to shy away from that. I don't think that Ethereum's ever going to lose market share. They're coming out with their ETH2. 
uh, which is based on, on the new way to do blockchain, the, the proof of uh, stake, which is much lower gas fees, much better for the environment, much quicker. Um, so I think, you know, depending on how things go with their, with their, new, um, their new emerging uh, ETH, I think they'll be dominant. I like a company called Wax, the Worldwide Asset Exchange. They're carbon negative. So they're not only carbon neutral, but they issue carbon credits um, you know, as tokens. Um, the more I play with them, the more I don't like their ecosystem, their user experience, their user interface. So I will be cheering for them. But um, I, I've, I have withdrawn my investments. You know, again, this is not financial advice, but personally, I've taken my money um, out of, of some of their projects. Um, but really, what's the, the blockchain future? In a word, it's interoperable. If stuff's only on Ethereum, only on Cardano, only on Polygon, it doesn't matter, right? Fill in the blank, then it's done, mm -hmm. right? In my opinion, that's a Web2 blockchain, right? Like, it doesn't mean that they don't have, um, you know, the blockchain capabilities and smart contracts and follow certain protocols, but if, if it's not interoperable, um, and if, if, there's, if there's not a... Com a complete disconnect from a specific crypto. Um, you know, I, I think that interoperable is the key word here. Um, so, you know, if I had to put one word to it and, and sign it off with the Corey Warfield, I'd say interoperable. But you know, mm -hmm. as far as the chains that I love, I don't love ETH, but I think it's I, I don't think it's going anywhere. Um, Cardano, Polygon, I'm I'm still really bullish on Binance. Um, I think we're I think Binance is uh, coming into its own. Um, and really anything, if you see proof of proof of work, that's the way that it, that it used to be when Ethereum was super expensive, gas fees and all that, I'd run away from anything proof of work. But if you see proof of stake and if you play with it and the experience isn't as terrible as, you know, at least one of the ones that I mentioned briefly, um, that, then I think they're probably uh, a good bet. I think this is a good question. How will businesses use NFTs and Web3 in the near future? Absolutely. So they're going to use NFTs to learn more about their customers, to deliver more uh, specialized experiences. They're going to use NFTs to reward their loyal customers and their new customers. They will be using Web3 and NFTs to train um, their new staff to do all of their hiring and HR practices. Uh, they mm -hmm. will be using NFTs to litigate anything and everything. Uh, NFTs and Web3 are going to make companies much more um, relatable to their world. So if it's a closed company, people can see what those clothes will look like on their avatar without leaving their house. If it's a recruitment company, people will be able to learn how to interview even better and find even better jobs that are suited to their, you know, strengths finders or whatever it might be. Um, I don't think that there's any anything that is not going to be basically put into the Web3 environment. And anything there where there needs to be a chain of custody, data needs to come and go as needed, that'll all be, you know, an NFT scenario. So um, I think recruiting is a big one. Anything HR, I think uh, understanding and relating to the customers is going to be a big one. Um, you know, training. I also think the businesses are going to be deploying NFTs as avatars of their employees to do work in the metaverse and make them more money, both for their employees and their companies. So you know, without, without going down a complete rabbit hole, I think that's, that's my vision of how the businesses are going to be leveraging both. Will Google or Amazon answer Web3 and monopolize services? So here's the good news. They, they've already tried. They've already failed. They will continue to try. They will continue <laughs> to fail. However, when you think about, at least from my version, right, of Web3, it's decentralized. There's nothing about Google or Amazon that's decentralized. So mm -hmm. um, you also, if something's decentralized, there can be no monopoly, right? A monopoly yes. is quite literally centralized. <laughs> so mm -hmm. like when to decentralize that, then there is no monopoly. I, I sense a fear here. I mean, in this question, like, will they want to do this and can they succeed it? They'll try. Google would love for the entire metaverse to be the Googleverse and everything lives in it. Of course they do. Um, it's mm -hmm. just it can't, that can't happen unless everybody wants it to because that's the way decentralization works. So as long as people don't want that, it can't happen. Now, mm -hmm. you know, could they 
come up with, uh, you know, some reason for everyone to, to get some chip or some medicine that makes them all think that Google Metaverse is the only best one. And, you know, maybe, I don't know. Um, I'm sure they're going to throw huge amounts of money at it. Uh, but I think at, at least fundamentally that can't happen because it's the opposite of decentralization. And frankly, that's why all of us maxis that are super into Web3 and all of that, we're there because we don't want the Google or the Amazon monopolies to pervade, uh, especially into this new internet. So mm -hmm. good question, but I think the, you know, the optimistic answer is they can't, they're going to try for sure. They're going to try. Um, yeah. Another one from Amanda. I want to join a community of people who are doing NFTs. Where do I start? Well, so yeah, good Amanda, question. <laughs> Amanda is an influencer on Instagram and YouTube and, and LinkedIn and the great places to find the community of people doing this are on YouTube uh instagram <laughs> okay. twitter and, and linkedin so you're you're already doing really well i'd say you know for everyone that's that was wondering that it's less about finding a community of people who are doing this it's more about finding the people that are doing this on whatever community you have or any environment that you resonate with if you love linkedin find the people you know just literally type in nfts or hashtag nfts and just search the people posting about it um there's private groups on Facebook as well. Um, you know, one of the things is find a project that you love, whether it's, you know, uh, a 30 ADA project on Cardano or you know, whatever it is, but find one that you like the art, you like the utility. There's a lot of stuff like girls in crypto, girls who code, like I'm really starting to back a lot of the female only um, projects. By the way, I want to get into the 10 million AI in just a moment as, as well, so I'll, I'll shift gears. But um, if you were to find a project that you love, get into their Discord. That is the community. Um, you know, do a little research or, you know, in the, in the case, like, Kazi knows me, so I can always point her specifically in the right direction. But I think find people wherever you already live and play talking about this and just kind of inundate yourself. Other than that, and everyone should follow Amanda on, on YouTube. Her reaction channel is incredible, but um, okay. YouTube is the place. YouTube is literally where I went to learn everything I could about blockchain, NFTs, metaverse, web three, when I was first getting interested. And right then you start to read some books and take some courses and all that too. But I think, you know, either just finding the right project to get involved with, or just watching some videos and following the people, subscribing to the people that resonate with you and, you know, a lot of them will have Patreons or stuff like that where you can join their private community. But um, I do a little bit of research and just, you know, kind of do some vibe checks first. Quickly, before we get into the next question. So the mm -hmm. Global AI Hub has an initiative and a hashtag called hashtag 10 million AI. Yes. We are going to help at least 10 million people around the world learn about machine learning, deep learning, AI totally for free. The mm -hmm. mandate is... We're going to let guys participate, too, because we're all about <laughs> equality, diversity, inclusion, but no less than half of those five, uh, 10 million. So at least 5 million of them are going to be women. And yes. I'm hoping it's more like seven or eight. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, and I yeah also we can do something. Than... <laughs> we can change it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's but, the so goal. If anyone's interested in being part of that movement, learning more, just supporting it, please do follow those hashtags again on whatever platforms you're active on. Also, I learn a lot, even though, you know, this is my world and I've studied it and, you know, I teach about it now. Um, I learn mm -hmm. a lot about machine learning AI by following Global AI Hub specifically on LinkedIn. Oh, so, you know, that's a super lightweight ask. I think anyone watching this, if you're not already following them, three seconds can, can be a game changer for you. Thank you for your support. My pleasure. Mm, so, we have some similar questions, so that's why I am I can take this as our last question, I think. And it's something personal. <laughs> you have your own podcast, Corey Connects, on Spotify, in which you issue the importance of connection. We would love to hear your side of the story. How do you leverage connection and technology to make your world a better place? So... First of all, thank you for doing your research. I hope that you have either listened to the show and love it or you will. It's interesting. My first episode ever 
was with the first female coach in the NFL and she's gone on to do, she's also an Olympic, uh, I think a three time Olympic gold medalist and right. She's mm. done all the things and I really like her and I like supporting her. I just saw a, a project a few days ago pitched me to get involved and I, I passed on the project, but I saw her name as one of their official advisors. I passed partially because it's competitive to something that I'm doing. So my first guest looks like she might be a competitor of mine. I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm the kind of guy where I don't drink a lot of soda, but I'll drink a, a Coke or a Pepsi or right. So I love healthy competition. Um, but that was just kind of a funny aside. And you know, I've had like the co-founder of LinkedIn and other people on my show, but I got this show because people are connecting me to all the right people. As a result of the show, I've met all of the right people. And so, <laughs> you know, as a LinkedIn influencer at this point, Corey Connects was a name given to me by, by my audience on one of my first live mm. streams a few years ago. And it's because I love to do shout outs and connect people and make intros and connect founders to investors and salespeople to leads and, you know, the whole nine yards. And so the connection is what got me the name Corey Connects. I kind of, you know, lived into that to the point where we're now, you know, a, a full fledged scale up a tech, tech company in Web3 and Metaverse. Um, but to answer your question, how do I leverage connection and technology? We're quite literally replicating everything I'm doing in the metaverse. That's what I'm going to be speaking about at the metaverse event is we're carbon, co we're carbon copying me as a coach um, into the mm -hmm. metaverse. And then we're going to work with a couple of the big YouTube influencers, you know, tens of millions of followers each help build them into the metaverse. And ultimately, we want to help any and everyone become a digitized version of themselves from the Internet so that they can meet more of the right people both on and offline and, and connect and you know, really using this decentralized technology to help effectuate that. So um, to hear more of my side of the story, I, you know, my podcast, I, I'm more focused on my guests, but I have been a guest on at least 152 other, uh, 200 other podcasts. So you can hear my story in a bunch of those. I welcome everyone to follow me on LinkedIn and anywhere else. I share my story. Um, and I'm yeah. so sorry, I'm going to get the name, I'm going to pronounce the name wrong, but I, I all yeah, I can do is apologize. Give a shot. Selene. Well, Selene, what I would love <laughs> to do. See, I need to learn some Turkish. So, yeah. Selene. I'm, yes. Is that close it's, enough? It's, yeah, it's very close, actually. It's Selen, but I know it's hard with. Uh, no, the, I got this. Watch this. Yeah. Selen. Um, <laughs> I, I, would, I would love to have a call with you at some point personally, and I'll, I'll share more of my story with you and answer any other questions. So. Um, I'll be looking for correspondence. Maybe maybe a global AI hub can connect the two of us. But I would love to tell you more of, of my course. side of the story. Yes. And I see some beautiful comments like this one. Um, also, some of our audiences got to know each other like they did. Um, so thanks again, Corey, for this webinar and for becoming our thought leader uh, in these areas. Uh, thank you for your time today. Uh, I think it was a great webinar. Thank you, our audience, for those questions. I hope that you enjoyed it and got your answers. Uh, for me, your way of uh, explaining stuff is the best way that... Uh, everyone can understand because we need some of yeah mm, how can i say we need sometimes the simple answer to understand better that's why it's important um so yes Selen said something back <laughs> thank you so do you want to add something else well, you know, I'll just kind of reiterate in closing first, I want to extend gratitude for you for having me, for bringing mm -hmm. me to the organization, for bringing me on today, and for everyone who took the time to tune in and to watch this. Um, I just want to, you know, again, say, please do follow Global AI Hub and hashtag uh, 10 million AI, very powerful work Thank that you. they're doing. If anyone's interested in kind of more about what we're doing at Corey Connects, please feel free to follow us or myself personally on yes. any of the channels and some of the companies that I mentioned that I'm bullish on. If anyone wants to look into them a little bit more, information.com is the data privacy on the blockchain. We've got our own NFT minting engine, snifty.io, S-N-I-F-T-Y. 
Nft.io. It stands for stands for Salesforce NFTs. And if you go there, you'll see my personal NFTs with my face on them, called the Quarter mm-hmm. Cards. Um, we're really we're we're getting ready to do that drop soon. We're really excited. Um, Mozverse. I highly encourage everyone to check out Mozverse. Mason Dow. Um, yeah, I'm sure I mentioned a couple others like Seek.com, TCG World. Ivan, thanks so much. I'm glad you tuned in as well. Um, but yeah, basically just thank you everybody for tuning in. The fact that you came here means that you're open-minded to this new world. Yes, I exactly. Everyone there. there is a lot of money, a lot of fun, a lot of opportunity there. Um, recommend any documents or books about Metaverse, Ready Player One. That really is best <laughs> one right now. Um, you know, I'm sure Kazi said it earlier, kind of kidding that this is like Metaverse for Dummies, but I think there is a Metaverse for Dummies book if you <laughs> like the For Dummies series. Um, you know, I, I'd say right now, if you wanted to learn more about blockchain, I'd, I'd read anything from Charles Hodgkinson, the founder of IOHK and Cardano. Again, he was one of the two guys that came up with Ethereum. Um, and uh, I ties and anyone, if you have any good books to recommend, I would love to as well, because I, I don't know too many great books about the metaverse yet, and I'd love to learn more. Oh, thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thanks for all the questions. <laughs> thank you. So, yes, this this is the end of our first expert talk. Uh, yeah, <laughs> shout out. <laughs> so thanks again, Corey, for everything. Um, also, I do recommend to follow Corey too. He always shared the most important, interesting content with the uh, most um, great explanations. Um, I do find it very interesting. I learned a lot of new things from you too. So thanks again. Um, Thank you. Thanks again for accepting my message and <laughs> proceeding with everything. So yeah. Oh, do it. Do we have 90 more seconds? Yeah, of course. You want you want you wanted me to explain and you haven't heard this uh, why I got involved yeah. with Global AI Hub and I, I'll tell so, you. So uh, let let me uh, go over the question again. I asked Corey that why did you ex- accepted my invitation to become a thought leader at Global AI Hub? So yeah, that's the uh, question. So the name was compelling. I'd already seen the name around. I then quickly clicked the, the company logo. A lot of mm-hmm. people don't have logos for their companies on LinkedIn. That's a big mistake. I clicked the logo to make sure it was a real company and to mm-hmm. just see what I was being proposed. And I saw like 50,000 followers and like 100 employees or something. And I said, wait, not only are they a real company, I scrolled to their about, saw they wanted to help people and help people for free and they couldn't access. And that's all I needed to know. But, you know, as someone right now that takes, you know, my my follower count, my engagement, everything very seriously, that mm-hmm. was one of the things that blew me away. It wasn't, you didn't have 80 followers and you thought if you worked with Corey Warfield, you could get 50,000. You have 50,000 mm-hmm. followers. That's 50,000 people that I can help and I can attach my name and, and social capital to to help even more people, to me, that was a no brainer. So the fact that you guys had done some early work and you know, to, to put on my investor hat for a second, we always look for traction, right? We mm-hmm. don't wanna invest in something that only needs our money so that they can get to a certain level. We wanna see people that have the initiative, uh, the determination, the tenacity to get there. And then they just need our help to get to the next level. So that's what I saw. I said, well, you guys are already doing this. You're gonna change the world with or without me. <laughs> I would love to help be part of that and maybe you know my help can even bring this to, to more people. Yes, yes, of course. Thank you for your kind words and for your support, really. My pleasure. Thank you, and Thank you, everyone. And thank thank you for our wizard behind the, the scenes as well. <laughs> yeah. The Global AI Hub team. Yes, thank you, everyone. So lots of love from uh, Istanbul, Turkey. Uh, to the U.S. and back at you. Okay, then um, I'm ending this broadcast. So thanks again, everyone. Goodbye, and see you in our next meeting, in our next webinar. Bye bye. Oh, you're good.